Hi, welcome to Cornerstone Virtual Sunday for January 17, 2021. I'm Mike Gillen, pastor of Cornerstone United Methodist Church. I'm so grateful we can join together for worship during this first month of 2021. To those of you who are new to Cornerstone, welcome and thanks for joining us. Please contact us at our website, cornerstoneofallon.org, clicking on the Contact Us tab, then filling out the Connect card. This gives us a chance to get to know you and you to know us better. To all of you who have Facebook pages, take a minute and click the share button on your virtual service to share it with your friends. Once you've done that, then click share now. Our scripture for today will be John 8 verses 1 through 11. I'll be reading from the message translation of the Bible. Take a moment and find the scripture so we can read it together. I'm wondering, is it possible to truly worship at a distance in different locations? If we believe in Jesus, if we believe the witness of the Bible, then it is possible to find a time of true worship through virtual technology. Jesus promises you and me in Matthew 18, 20, where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am among them. Through the Holy Spirit, we are literally brought together by this virtual technology. So let's worship together. Find in this time a place of sanctuary where God creates for you an experience of sacred space and time, knowing you're with other people of God. Join me in worship as we enter this time in prayer. God, today we seek you, knowing you've been seeking us out. In some part of our hearts and minds, we've experienced your spirit connecting to us. Today, open us up to your lesson of grace, helping us to see how you work to forgive us and leave us to le lead us to live better by faith. Remind us that we are invaluable to you, that you never give up on us. In Christ's name, amen. May you find during this time of worship that God removes those things that distract you. And in the next few minutes, may you discover God really communicating to your heart. Allow God to change you just a little bit for the better. Let's continue worshiping with our affirmation of faith. We find in the Apostles' Creed a statement of faith that binds us together with Christians that are both throughout history and found all around the world. Join me in being bound together with one another through our affirmation of faith. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. May this ancient creed become a statement of faith for you that helps you and shapes your faith. Our scripture for this worship service is John 8, verses 1 through 11. I'll be reading from the message translation of the Bible. Hear these words of life meant for you and me today. Jesus went across to the Mount of Olives, but he was soon back in the temple again. Swarms of people came to him. He sat down and he taught them. The religious scholars and Pharisees led in a woman who had been caught in an act of adultery. They stood her in plain sight for everyone and said, Teacher, this woman was caught red-handed in the act of adultery. Moses, in the law, gives orders to stone such persons. What do you say? They were trying to trap Jesus into saying something incriminating so they could bring charges against him. Jesus bent down and wrote it with his finger in the dirt. They kept at him, badgering Jesus. He straightened up and said, the sinless one among you, go first, throw the stone. Bending down again, Jesus wrote some more in the dirt. 
Hearing that, they walked away, one after another, beginning with the oldest. The woman was left alone. Jesus stood up and spoke to her, Woman, where are they? Does no one condemn you? No one, Master. Neither do I, said Jesus. Go on your way. From now on, don't sin. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. This is one of those crucial scriptures that helps us to understand who Jesus is and who we're meant to be. This is the third in a message series titled, Worth Saving. Each week we're discovering that God is working to save our family, friends, community, and even us. Today I'm looking at the ways God's forgiveness is more powerful than we comprehend. We will see that Jesus saves a woman from certain death and in the process leads her to live better by faith. I remember once when I was very young, throwing a ball up on the roof of our house over and over again. My little brother was in an upstairs window watching me. It was a warm day and the window was pushed up. My brother was looking through a screen, you know those screens that keep the bugs out, his head resting on the windowsill. He was probably two, I was five. I throw the ball on the roof, thump, 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 then a metallic boom as it skips off the gutter. I step back a little farther, throw again, farther, throw again, thump, 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 boom. I step a little too far back. I throw one too many times. I hit the top of the window. One of the panes of glass falls to the sill in a big chunk, narrowly missing my little brother. I am a worried little boy at this point. I'm in big trouble. My father and mother will be so mad. My mom rushes to find out what happens. I apologize to my mom over and over again. I'm so sorry I broke the window. I'm so sorry I almost hit my brother. I didn't mean to do it. I say over and over again. My mother says, we'll wait for your father. When my father gets home, he sits me down at the dinner table and says, your mom told me how sorry you are that you broke the window. She also said you were very worried about your brother. So I'm not going to punish you. Woo! <laughs> I was not getting in trouble, I thought. I was so happy. I was relieved. My little five or six-year-old self could not believe that I was not going to be punished. Then my dad gave me a half-hour lecture on the importance of being careful, thinking about what I was doing before I did it and how much something like a window cost. Half-hour lecture. Kind of a punishment. Dad meant well, but I was really too young to understand what all the nickels and dimes in front of me on the table really meant. He was trying to explain how much a window costs and how to be more careful not to break stuff. All my young mind could comprehend, though, was that I was being forgiven. My first encounter with forgiveness on a level that really impacted me. Do you remember a time when you were offered forgiveness? I mean, I mean really forgiven. You know, where you did something really wrong and someone gave you a second chance. You understand what I'm asking, don't you? I'm thinking about a time in your life when someone had compassion for you and offered you a gracious moment when your transgressions were literally wiped away. The experience of forgiveness is a powerful thing, maybe the most powerful. It changes the way we live when we're forgiven. Forgiveness also changes the one who forgives. The forgiver discovers their character is deepened, that there is a goodness in their soul that is broadened. John 8, this passage we've just read, is one of the critical gospel lessons into the historic identity of Christians and how we understand who Jesus is. It constructs for us a, a very clear image of our Savior. Jesus is one who compassionately sees us in all of both our worst, worst tendencies and our greatest sins. And in his compassion, Jesus offers to forgive us for our mistakes and save us from destroying one another. On our own, the lesson is, we humans seem to devolve at times into amoral packs of wild animals who will destroy anyone who threatens what we value most, often justifying it based on things that we hold dear, ideas and laws. At our worst, we don't see that we are all united by a few defining truths. One truth is, 
we're all created by God. Two, we all sin. Three, God has created us to be servants of God and each other. And four, we can find in Christ a saving grace that leads us away from sin and toward our intended servant identity. John 8 reveals a moment when religiously minded men, really religious folks, in a temple, in the temple, want to justify their beliefs and put Jesus in his place. They think they can trick Jesus by bringing a woman before him who's been caught in adultery, a crime that their scriptures define as deserving death by throwing stones at her. Jesus reveals who he is in this moment. He saves the woman from being caught, uh, from being put to death, rather. And he saves her accusers from killing her. Jesus makes sure that both the woman and the men are safe from their sinful tendencies. Those men ignorantly, misguidedly were sinning. They think they're following the scriptures in a way that will fulfill God's will for them by throwing stones at this woman or by forcing Jesus to violate some divine tenet that's within him. But the men were misguided. They were sinning without realizing it. These religious men didn't understand that their hearts were already corrupt. As much in need of saving as the woman they'd brought before Jesus. John 8 reveals to each of us that Jesus exposes our universal need to be saved. This need doesn't disappear if we go to church or say a prayer, or read the Bible. John 8 exposes Jesus' relentless efforts to make clear that salvation is as much about learning to live better by faith in this life as it is about an eternity with God. So, again, what do we learn from John 8? We discover that Jesus is saying to each of us that we don't need to pick up stones, especially against other followers of Christ. God will be God. God is our creator, sustainer, redeemer, and judge. Jesus is showing us that we can allow God to be God. So what is Jesus saying our job is? Our job is to serve God and others by following Christ. Following Christ means taking his instruction to the woman seriously. Again, Jesus stood up and spoke to the woman. Woman, where are they? Does no one condemn you? No one, master. Neither do I, says Jesus. Go on your way. From now on, don't sin. Jesus shows us what salvation looks like in this life, and the woman calling Jesus master shows us what our way should be too. Today is a day when you and I can realize we are all created by God, part of a good creation. God wants us to move forward, uh, away from the misguided moments of our lives. God's created us to serve God and each other instead. And Christ wants to offer all of us forgiveness in order that we will live better by faith. What is Christ leading you to do today? How can Christ's forgiveness be part of your life? As you seek forgiveness from Christ, understand Christian faith's forgiveness should change how you treat others, taking away the natural tendency that you and I have to throw stones at others. May you receive Christ's forgiveness today and be changed. We've been in this series worth saving, looking at stories of salvation for the last few weeks. A lost sheep, friends tearing up a roof, stones dropped to the ground. All of these Bible stories reveal Jesus Christ is working every moment of our lives to save our family, our friends, our community, and even us. Decide today to allow Christ's salvation to lead you to imitate Christ. Amen. One way to allow the forgiving grace of Christ to become a deeper part of your soul is through prayer. Prayer can be a step forward in faith. God is leading us forward in faith literally every day. We're created to serve God, follow Christ, and live in the Holy Spirit. Each day is an opportunity to take a step forward in faith, to live better by faith, and to grow in love toward God and others. Understand that prayer leads us to live better by faith in a, a daily, progressive way. Prayer is our lifeline to God, giving clarity to what God wants for us and explaining how the Bible's teachings can become part, part of our life literally every day. As we pray together, talk with God about the next steps forward 
God wants you to take. Ask for courage to share those steps with other Christians. Remember this, prayer is meant to be not just about our own needs, but also about the needs of others. So let's begin this week together with prayer. God, we come to you, believing that your son reveals who we're meant to be. So often we tend to pick up stones and throw them at others. Oftentimes we who are followers of Christ pick those stones up and throw at other followers because we don't like the way they live or what they say or what they do. Today, God, help us to put down those stones and instead to receive your forgiveness. Show us how to live better by faith. Explain to us, God, that you're never done with us, that you're always working to improve us. Remind us as well of those people around us who need, need your love and care. May we be their servants this week. Now, God, remind us of what it means to be your people. Teach us to pray as we remember your son's prayer, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. It's been great to be with you for this Cornerstone Virtual Sunday. I hope you've been inspired to search for God this week, understanding that God is literally reaching out to you daily. Also this week, hope you'll think about the people in your life who you can invite to worship with you through Cornerstone Virtual Sunday. There's never been an easier way for you to guide someone else to participate in church through this virtual technology. Who is God leading you to invite? As we conclude our time together, allow me to offer a final blessing. As we leave this time, the grace of God and light of Christ go before us. Be blessed today and be a blessing this week to a world that desperately needs Christ's saving grace. Amen.